here to just hear your word and thank you for the worship this morning and how sweet it was to our ears, to our soul. And so God, I just ask you to just bless this time, bless our ears, open our hearts, Lord, and let it be you that speaks to all of us. We ask for your blessing on this time now. In Jesus' name, pray. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. All right. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mike Lum. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I work with Scott, uh, your pastor. And so, first thing he told me to let you know is to God bless all the Raiders fans in here. Because I heard that you know, he's a big supporter of the Raiders. <laughs> Actually, so I know he's a Bucks fan. But, uh, and uh, we went to the ACSI conference, which is a teacher's conference. And uh, me and him were roommates. So Scott, uh, the Raiders game was on Monday night, and Scott and them were all cheering against the Raiders, and I'm the only guy cheering for the Raiders. And so uh, we had kind of separated, went different paths, and I said, well, you know, if they win tonight, you're going to have some nightmares probably. And he goes, oh, uh, whatever. So and then we talked in the morning, but it was a good time. So uh, it's fun to teach with them. Scott, teach, uh, Scott gives me all the kids that don't dress out. <laughs> But uh, today I'm going to be in Matthew chapter 5 uh, and give you a little bit more about me. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree from Joshua Springs Bible College and uh, through that process I decided I wanted to become a teacher. But before I ever started doing that, um, I, uh, I got in trouble. I didn't know the Lord. I was uh, not very wise and uh, I used to drink a lot of alcohol. And I got a DUI and I hit somebody. And it caused the person that I hit to crash and roll their car and <coughs> shatter their wrist. And so I went to jail in San Bernardino for 17 days. And I remember sitting in jail thinking, it's not what I had ever planned for my life. I never anticipatedly thought I'd be in jail. Never, never. So I decided, well, whatever I'm doing in life is not working. So I, I cried out to God there, even though I didn't have a Bible and uh, I didn't know the Lord. I cried out to Him, and I really feel that that would be the time that He started to talk to me. Although He'd probably been talking to me a long time beforehand, but I'm pretty deaf. And so, uh, and being being a guy, sometimes I'm kind of hard headed. So God uh, sent me here to Yucca Valley, and then uh, I started going to church at Joshua Springs, and then everyone's like, well, you should go to Bible college. I'm like, well, I don't want to be a, a minister or whatever it is you guys think of. But uh, it is what it is, and then uh, I got told in court when I was doing my uh, restitution hearing, uh, the judge asked me, what do you want to do with yourself? And I just got out of the Marine Corps. I did nine years in the Marine Corps. I was like, I don't know. Maybe I want to be a teacher. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And uh, so... They basically told me, good luck, you have a felony now. You're not going to be a teacher. So I took that as a personal challenge to become a teacher. So it's been a long road. And I went to uh, Shasta Bible College, which is in Red located in Reading. And I got a bachelor's degree from them this year. And I'm uh, working on my master's right now for administration and uh, curriculum and education. So I don't know what God's doing with me. I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know if I'm going to be a pastor one day or keep teaching. I don't have a clue. But I just want to keep riding the way with the Lord as much as possible. And so I'm honored to be here today. Uh, Matthew chapter 5 is where I'm going to teach out of today. Uh, and Matthew is the gospel, is gospel there, the first gospel. And uh, basically, Matthew is a great book because uh, Matthew is written by a Jew. And he's writing to the Jews. And uh, so it's like someone that everyone could relate to is talking to them. And uh, I think that's really important uh, because even for us here today in America, in Twenty Nine Palms, in Yucca Valley, California, in the United States, basically when somebody's speaking to you, if you can't relate to that person's message, it's, it's pointless. It's kind of whatever. I'll give you an example. So, uh, many pastors and schools will talk about Jesus and uh, when he was up in the upper room and he decided uh, to wash all the feet of the disciples. And I've seen pastors, they'll teach about this and uh, 
some schools they'll even go to the point to wash your feet. Uh, there's a lot of disconnection with that. And although uh, we don't understand everything, so I'll try to put as much perspective as today. When you go to Walmart or a lot of places today, what's the first thing you hear when you walk through the door? A greeter, right? Hey, how are you? Thank you for coming. They, they talk to you. And that's almost everywhere you go. If you go to a fast food place, they yell at you behind the counter sometimes. Uh, but it's that idea of when you go in places that someone greets you. Well, they had, I don't know if they had greeters back then, but what they did have is they had a slave that washed your feet. Because they didn't have socks, they didn't have roads, they had dirt, and so their, your feet were nasty. And so they, that was just a customary tradition. Uh, and to me, this is like the closest traditional thing I could get to you to try to make a connection. Because traditionally, when we walk in, that's what we do. We're not getting our feet washed. I'm a guy. You don't touch my feet. <laughs> now, this cannot be the same for ladies, because you all sometimes go to that, you know, that place where they do your nails, and maybe they do a pedicure, and they wash your feet, I think, and they do, I mean, so ladies, <laughs> not the same thing. You, But guys, you ain't touching my feet. Now, I've heard some guys go get pedicures. I've never done it. It's not on my top 10 to-do list, either. <laughs> so it ain't gonna happen. Maybe not before I go to the Lord, you know, but uh, so for us That is not something we can relate to with Jesus doing and then the other thing is uh, The person that did it was a slave Well, the people that greet us they get money. They're not slaves So we don't have slaves. I, I don't know. I'm pretty sure nobody in this room here has ever had a slave So it's really I mean we've learned about slavery and all that but we we don't really, we've never experienced it firsthand. And so we can't, you know, when you say that, it's just a concept. We, oh yeah, a slave, or the person owns a person. It's a concept. It's not reality to us. So when Jesus took the position to wash their feet, he took the position from the aspect of a slave. And that's why they're like, no, we don't. We don't look at you like that. We look at you as our leader. Jesus came to serve. And a lot of people, we, it's hard because a lot of churches today, and I'm not picking on your church because I don't know you guys, right? But, and obviously my church, I see a lot of same things that I've seen here. But there's other churches where those people that are serving in the pulpit or other positions, they want to be served. They have a special parking spot. They have this and that. And, it, and although sometimes it's an honor and all that, uh, Jesus didn't have all that. He never tried to aspire to have that. He wanted to serve the people. That's what he came for. And so as we serve God, we're here to serve the people. That's what we're supposed to do. Serve. Not be honored. It's an honor that God would choose us. Because... You know, you know a little bit about me. But from what I've studied about people, I mean, even though we're all different, we're all alike in a lot of ways. I mean, you watch people do stuff, and they're so much the same in so many different ways. And it, it's amazing. Now, obviously, not everybody is the same, but you'd be surprised. I mean, if you have kids, you know, I have five. Uh, my littlest one's 10 months, so she can walk now, kind of, like 10 steps. She's got two bob teeth now. Her name's Esther. She's a cute little girl. And that's I wanted my last kid to be a girl. That's why I have five. So, <laughs> and, well, I'm going to say this. And my wife, when we were talking about getting married, when we were engaged, she goes, I want five kids. I said, you're crazy, man. What do you want five kids for? But when I got the three... I learned it didn't matter anymore because you only got two hands and they only listen so much. So I said, we're having five. She tried to stop at four. I won that. <laughs> Jesus is told us to serve. He told us to, to love others. It's hard to love others. 
It's easier to love people you don't know than it is to love the people you know at times. And so, it's just a little bit there. So, Jesus basically, Matthew, he starts off with, uh, Matthew starts off with the birth of Jesus. What a perfect time, right? That's what we celebrate Christmas for. It's what we should celebrate. And uh, the tree, and some of it's paganism involved with it, and I know that. But I still love having a tree. And it helps me be more thinking about the Lord. That's just from my perspective. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I grew up with a tree. grew up with Christmas lights. I grew up with Bean Crosby. And uh, no Jesus. So when I learned about Jesus, I have a hard time saying, I don't want to do this traditional stuff. Because for me, that's like a part of the excitement. And then Christmas Day will come, and this happens to me every year. Um, I don't get what I really want sometimes. <laughs> or I get what I really want, but now I have it. And I'm depressed on Christmas Day. I'm depressed after those presents are over. I hate it. Like, I always have to battle that little thing, and I know it's coming. Because I, I set up Christmas pretty much after Thanksgiving. I don't like to do it too much earlier than that, because... Well, that's just wrong. You gotta eat that turkey first before you start doing this. <laughs> so I just to me, this is all part for me. This is how I celebrate. You know, like I have a hard time with Halloween. I didn't grow up having horror festivals. So for me, I like to have a scary house. I wanna have spooky stuff. I get it, uh, that there's bad stuff associated, I understand that, and I can teach that to my kids, but a part of me still longs to do those traditional things. But, you know, I pray to God about it. Uh, I'm not out hunting for black cats or anything now. <laughs> That'd just be wrong, but uh, I play at Spooky Sounds. And then I watch my kids for uh, screen. That's fun for me. <laughs> uh, so Jesus goes from there and then uh, goes to the birth and then he's only in chapter 5. He's uh, uh, Chapter 4, though, he was walking around he was healing people, and he was healing people in all kinds of areas. Uh, he went from Syria, and uh, he went around uh, from there to Galilee, Galilee Deca, Decapolis. He was messing up the names, I can do it too. Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. And while Jesus was doing going to all those places, he healed the sick people that were afflicted with various diseases and torments. Uh, there were demon possessed. There was epileptic people. There were paralytics. And, God, and Jesus healed all kinds of different people from all over. And so people followed him. Lots of people followed him. So we get to chapter 5. And so Jesus sees these people Lots and lots of people. He goes up to this mountaintop and he sits, uh, takes a seat and his disciples come up and Jesus starts teaching only his disciples at this point. Not all the people. So uh, there's a lot of thoughts about that. Now, Matthew chapter 5 is about, the beginning here is about the Beatitudes. And so some people would say that the Beatitudes were only for the disciples. Some people would say, well, it's not just for the disciples, it's for Christians today. I think if you're reading it, it's for you. Because it takes a lot of people to sit down and read the Bible now. And there's a lot of people that won't really take the time to read it. I don't know a lot of Christians that they, they're not that good at reading the Bible. Because life gets in the way. But I have something to say about that. I won't say it right now yet. But you guys got the Ten Commandments right here. And uh, I'm sure you've heard it been said, if you do two other things instead of those Ten Commandments, now you love the Lord God, your Father, with all your heart, your mind, and your soul, and you are to love your neighbor as yourself, you will fulfill all Ten Commandments. Now I'm not talking about the neighbor that lives next door to you. Your neighbor's everybody you know, and people you don't. Anyone you come in contact with would technically be your neighbor. So if you love those people, and you love God, and you put God first in your life, you don't have to do those same commands because 
you will do those Ten Commandments. Honor your mother and father. Well, that's mom and dad to be your neighbor. You love your neighbor. You're going to honor them. If you love them, you're going to honor them. So, you're not going to want to kill anybody. You know, you won't have an idol. So, those are the main things. But, uh, I always look at that and I look at these Beatitudes. I think there's a connection. And I've looked and looked and looked, and sometimes I, I think I figure it out, and then I don't. And sometimes when I read this, I don't really, uh, with, even with all that education, I, I really don't think I'm as smart as some people claim anyway. Uh, I, you know, I teach middle schoolers, that's great, 6 through 8, that's ages 10 through maybe 14, 15 if you're lucky. And uh, these kids, they challenge me every day. By the way, uh, because they teach middle school students, if you are doing anything that most people would fry, like picking Joe's or whatever, I don't worry, I won't fry it at all. I see it all the time. But uh, the kids, they get it. They get a lot more than people think. A 10 year old understands a lot more than most people would uh, see. And they see everything you're doing. I would say most people uh, have today a smartphone. And I have one, I'm guilty. I own like four or five of them actually. But I always felt like I'm so connected to that addictive phone. Like it's such a huge part of my life. It's a phone, right? It's supposed to just be something you call on. But we've turned it into this massive microcomputer that fits in your pocket, which I don't like for half the stuff it does. And now you're always, I don't know, I feel like I was really kind of trapped after a while. So going to shock you. I have a piece of history in my pocket. This is called a flip phone. <laughs> and I've converted back to it because I don't need all that stuff. I mean, I can use it, but I'm not on my phone all the time now because games aren't that good. And texting is really, really hard. You know, you got to push the button so many times to text. <laughs> so I tell people, look, if you need to talk to me, please call me. And if it's an email, I'll get to it when I get to my computer. Because everything else is so connected. A smartphone, you get your emails. People are impatient now. You, an email, it's, it's got the word mail in it, and you have that thing outside called the mailbox, which typically is full of junk. But it's supposed to be a way of transportation, a message to somebody that's not fast. And so all we've done by making electronics, at least you get it right now, sometimes 10 minutes, but that's just based on your internet signal. But the idea is we've made everything so instant and everybody wants an answer right now. If somebody texts you and, I mean, my wife texts me and then she'll send me a question mark if I haven't answered in 30 seconds. I'm like, I'll get to it. We have to be patient. It's hard to be patient. I'll be honest, I don't like being patient either. But. Life goes by faster every year. I've heard this say it for years. I just turned 41 in November, and every year it just gets faster and faster. And I am extremely busy. That That is no joke. I teach. I also teach what's called the drum corps, which is a little bit of a music program at the school there. So I do that like three days a week. And then we do performances for like basketball, and football, and all that. And then I have my schoolwork, and then I have my family, and I want to spend time with my kids. And I think we're owed as parents to spend time with our kids. You know, a lot of people don't think about it, but your kids spend more time with your teacher than you. So wherever they're at school, the teacher is important. Maybe get to know those people a little bit. I see kids all the time. I hear uh, problems all the time. Some kids will even share with me some of the things going on at their house. Whether their mom or dad are doing marijuana or something. Those are sad things. I'm at a Christian school. And it doesn't mean that the people that go are Christian. Or it doesn't mean the parents that send them are Christian. I like to think they are. But the sad reality is they're not. I got... Some eighth graders have told me they're not Christian. 
sometimes living our faith is not enough to actually get to them, to get people to believe. I mean, you didn't believe until something was personal to you. It had to be personal. I didn't believe until something personal happened to me. So I can tell these kids to, that God is real. They want to know why. How is he real? Because I've seen him work in my life. And that's why I always recommend it to the students. I recommend it to adults too. Keep a journal. Now ladies, that's called a diary. Gentlemen don't keep diaries, they keep journals, right? I gotta tell the kids that too, because oh boy, he wants to keep a diary. So I'll tell them to keep a journal. But the reality is, if you write in there a little bit every day, and then once every six months, once a month, something, go back and read your journal. You will have evidence before your eyes that God's worked in your life. We need that. Because we forget. Last week was a pretty rough week for me. I'll forget it in a couple days. The week before was really rough. That was Thanksgiving. My kids all had strep throat. They're not contagious, by the way. Uh, me giving them an antibiotic. But the problem is, I got home Friday night. We had a football game. I went to that. My wife was home. And then Saturday, I had my kids had temperatures. My boy Nathan had spots on his face. And we're like, Mom, what's going on? My wife's a nurse. So you, sometimes that's really good and sometimes not so good. Because uh, like when we have to give meds, I have to give it at a certain time and i got to follow some protocol. I didn't even know it existed. <laughs> Most of you just get medicine, right? You're not like watching it. Uh, no, my wife is like, you're doing it this time and this much and you make sure to eat and this and that. I'm like, all right, I'll get it, baby. I love you. Bye. So, uh, but that that's my life. It's busy. And so, but Thanksgiving week, Wednesday night, I was in the ER on Wednesday night. Go home at 3 in the morning for my baby girl. Had a 103.1 temp. That's bad. Of course, I gave her Tylenol. Went to the ER. We get there. Within an hour after we were there, the temp had gone down. And because everything else was going on, no one thought she might be teething. I didn't think she was teething. I thought she got strep throat. Now all my kids except her got strep throat because babies that young don't get strep throat, I guess. That's what the doctor says. But I always forget when they're teething, they cut the temperature, but it was a little higher than it should be. Now she's got two little teeth right there. And she thinks she can climb on mountains. <laughs> Alright, so, now I'm going to get to the meat, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. This is five, chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. I'll just read through these real quick. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they re revel and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets and were who were before you. I'm going to go backwards a little bit on this. Now, right there at the end, Jesus is talking, remember, to the disciples. And he told them, hey, you're going to get, you're going to catch a lot of heat for serving me. Okay? And you're going to have to deal with this. But you're blessed for it. Now, when I read through those, I, uh, I, I look up a lot of words because I like to know what every word means because uh, that's the only way I can understand things. So, uh, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, when we look at the word poor, it says, you can't, you don't have enough money. It's exactly what it says. 
You don't have enough money to pay something, to pay for something. And uh, we're not paying for anything, but we're talking about the Spirit. I'm going to say maybe the Holy Spirit. Or maybe your walk with Christ. You don't have enough Spirit. That's that. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed. Uh, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So you don't have enough spirit. Well, that's what I'm reading. That's what it says. I even got the King James out because sometimes it's a little different, you know. And uh, it said the same thing. So I thought, oh God, I don't understand that. If you don't have enough spirit and you're blessed. So I went on from there. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, when you mourn, typically we mourn when someone's died. I mean, sometimes I mourn when I'm born. But, uh, so, and mourning kind of comes naturally, but sometimes some people don't want to mourn when somebody's gone away. Some people are really good at holding grudges. Now, I don't know any of you in here, so... If this uh, touches your heart, you need to thank Jesus. Not me, because I don't know you. But uh, if you hold a grudge against somebody, I got some really bad news. The person you hold a grudge against, unless you're like antagonizing them personally or attacking them in some way, they don't know. It doesn't affect their life. It only affects you. You're like in, uh, you're like in prison. Uh, I had this one pastor taught me once. Uh, he said, pretend your head has a bunch of rooms. And you're basically giving one of those rooms for rent free to the person that you are holding a grudge against. They have no clue. They're going to go on their life. You're the one that's going to suffer. you got to forgive them. Now, for those of you that don't want to forgive, because I can get that, um... I always start off with telling God, I don't want to forgive this person, God. I mean, I just tell them, I'm, I'm pretty honest. I'm going to be honest with God. If you're going to be honest with anybody, you start with God. You, you know, don't, if you're not going to be honest with anybody else, just start only being honest with God, because He already knows. He just wants you to be, He wants to see if you know. So, tell God, you don't want to forgive this person. And tell them why. And tell them every day. Typically, what I've noticed is one day you say, all right, God, I'll forgive him. But you're going to have to help me because I don't want to do it yet. But at least if you tell God you're talking about it, and God knows, he'll work with you. He's, he's ever so gracious. He's the most patient person ever. God is so patient that he wishes that not one person should perish. Not one. That all would come to know him and have everlasting life. All. That's why I haven't come back yet. Now, he's going to come back one day. And, I don't know. I thought the time was near. With the, especially after this last election. I thought it was real soon. <laughs> but now I think we'll have a little bit of a reprieve. I don't know. We'll see. But, uh, yeah, times are dark. And you can look at the president, and you can look at all that just happened, and that's really, if you just look at those eight years to come, or four years to come, it's probably four, but we'll see. Uh, that's a really small picture. You have to look at it a little bit further. Because there's a lot of things already set into motion. In the 1970s, they started to work towards teaching Common Core to students. When school was designed, it was designed to teach people how to work into a factory. When you say, how so? Well, they sat in rows. They had a very orderly thing. They had 30-minute lunches. It was very organized and set up to that way. It's still that way today. Schools are still that way. We well, say, well, you know, Mr. Lum, uh, it's best that the students test space four because the whiteboard's up there. Well, I like to defy and break all those rules as much as possible in my classroom. I make tests do all kinds of things in my class, and I don't always teach from the front. I, well, I walk like back and forth all around. I make those kids turn around because they're going to do it anyways. So I don't want them to walk into a classroom and open a book and read. Now, I'll be honest, that's the first thing they do in my class. They come to my class, they open the Bible, and they read the Bible out loud every day. 
Because when I was teaching Bible and I had a Bible book that was telling me about the Bible, I didn't feel like there was enough Bible in Bible. So I said, we're going to read the Bible every day. So this year we're reading Psalms. We're on chapter 64, Monday morning. Every day they read. We talk about Psalm 119 or Epistle what if we don't finish it one day? Well, then we're going to do it in two. But we're going to read it. Because if you don't make them read the Bible every day, initially, they're not going to read the Bible. Now, when I do parent-teacher conferences, I get some great surprises. I have parents that tell me their kids actually study in their classroom. I mean, at home. And that pleases me to hear that. Because I have no idea what I'm doing sometimes makes a difference. And the kids, they all tell me they like me. And I let them know, thank you, but you're lying. Uh, <laughs> tell me you will not teach you a better grade in my class. <laughs> and so, uh, we have to read, we have to pray, and I forget. Life's busy. But if we don't make time for God, then, I mean, God's trying to speak to you, and you can't hear Him. God never quits. He's like non-stop. Open 24 hours to serve you. Blessed are the Lord who? Uh, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the kingdom. Now meek is not weak. And I'm sure you've heard that before. Meek is basically being Submissive and respectful. Be submissive and respectful to God, to Jesus. It's hard though. I could say it right now and you think, okay, I'll be submissive. But you all have plans today. You all have schedules in your life. And so unless it changes, unless you, you know, if you look at the greatest pastors in the world, they, they all, uh, they, they interview some of those guys, they all say they wish they would have spent more time with God. Not with their family. Not with their jobs. In fact, most of them spend more time with their jobs. They wish you would have spent more time with God. And so, I can say the same thing. I wish I would spend more time with God. But, my first ministry is my, my family. If you leave a 10 month old baby that can walk around by herself, she'll find stuff. She might even need it. You can't let her do that. So, you have to find other time. So my time is not early in the morning because I get up at 5.30 and that's early enough. But mostly at night for me. But I don't have a, a prayer time. My prayers are short and sweet and fast. <coughs> I have bad knees. I'm not getting on my knees and pray. I might not get up. Or I might have to fall down and roll around and get up. <laughs> but God knows all that. God knows all about all of you. He, a lot of times in church we've made so many formalities. And now granted, it's taken from here. But God wants you to be honest with Him. He wants you to be real with Him. And you can still be respectful and honoring to God, but you don't have to be uh, superficial about it. You don't have to light a candle to God. I like candles, though. But you don't have to have it be a certain way. You can just talk to Him. He'll listen. He listened to you anyway, especially when you're driving and yelling at that guy in front of you to tell him get out of the way. <laughs> and then I say, I'm sorry, Lord. Uh, blessed are the merciful. Oh, wait, I skipped one. Blessed are those who hunger for thirst and, and thirst for righteousness. Hunger and thirst basically means that you're hungry, you want something, you need to eat, you need to drink, your mouth is dry. Righteousness is right being right before God. You should want to be hungry and thirsty to be right before God. 
I think a lot of people actually do. But we get lost. In reality, in life, we have to read the Bible. We have to pray. We have to work, uh, go to church and fellowship. You have to do that stuff. But it's not enough to do that stuff. You have to have a relationship with Christ. In doing so, when you do those things, there's a lot of do's and it's true. But the other side of the coin is much different. The other side of the coin is all the miracles that God fulfilled in your life. All the times He spoke to you. All the times He saved you from something. All the stuff that is spiritual and untangible that you can't put in your pocket. That stuff is the stuff that makes you have a relationship. That completes the relationship. We easily can have a list in our lives and check off the boxes. That's so easy for us. But that other side is the side that you can't, you can't grab it. You can't do anything with it. It has to just happen. That's what completes your walk with God. That's what makes the relationship real. If you don't come to church, you can't fellowship with Christians. I work with Christians, so I, oh, I don't need to do it. No, you need to do it. Because even at a place where Christians work, there's still people we're still sinners, and we still have our attitude. You know, church is usually late in the morning or at night, right? It's not real early. Well, they do have those early services at some places, but I never wake up for those. But, I mean, when you first wake up out of bed, you might be grumbly. You might be in a lot of pain. When I get out of bed, I can't walk right. Like, I look like I've been drugged. But I'm not drunk. My legs, they're drunk. They all hurt. They both want to move. It takes me a good 10 minutes. I turn on the shower. I go in the shower. I sit there for like 15 minutes and hot water before I do anything. I was like, because I don't know what else to do. I don't think I can move my arms and my legs. But in the morning when you wake up, that's you, you, you're, who are you? Are you saying, oh God, it's Monday. Or thank God it's Monday. We need to be thankful for every day. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Basically, you got pulled over, you deserve a ticket, and they didn't give it to you. Some people would even say they gave you a steak dinner for Outback or something. <laughs> Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. God is, well, that's not what I want to say, but He is the great I Am. I love that statement, I Am. <coughs> Whatever you need, He's there. I Am your life. I Am your wealth. I Am your food. I Am your whatever. That's what the great I Am. But, uh, rested on a pure heart. The heart is the soul. <coughs> source for your uh, your emotions, your feelings. Be pure in it. Blessed are those the peacemakers, for they shall be called the Son of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So, I did a little thing after I got through there, and now so I'm going to do it a little differently. So when you're poor in spirit, it means you're empty, right? And then you mourn because you're empty. Because you did something that makes you mourn. After you mourn, you uh, should repent. You should repent, which means you turn the other way. Because repenting means you don't want to go that way anymore. You don't want to do that one thing anymore. Whatever it is. After you repent, you should hunger and thirst for righteousness. To be right with God. God's going to show you mercy. After all that, you'll start to become pure in heart. After you're pure in heart, you'll become a peacemaker.
And then you're going to start serving God and Jesus with everything. And you're going to be persecuted for righteousness sake. God's plan, God's messages, they're perfect for everybody. It's written for everybody. It's not written for just super smart people. It's written for not super smart people. Which is good for me because I need all the help I can get. But God is that person in our lives who's going to guide and direct you. You know, Christmas is coming and you're all going to have your family stuff hopefully and all that. I guess if I could challenge you, I don't really like to challenge people, but maybe I should. If I could challenge you, help somebody that is in need. And I know your church will do fundraisers and stuff, but you, as an individual, one person, you have friends. You know people. And God will tell you when things aren't right. God will tell you when you should help. Listen to your heart. It's the great communicator for you and the Lord. Alright, and so let's pray. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for this time. I thank you for your messages, especially to me, to everybody, Lord. I hope and pray that you gave a, a message to people here today. And I ask that you just bless their meeting that they're going to have, Lord. They're going to talk about money. That's always fun. So just ask to bless that, to guide that. Lord, I ask you bless the time of fellowship afterwards, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you just bless everyone's week, Lord, as they get ready to go. And uh, some people are cheerful, and that's good. But, uh, Lord, I just ask you just be with us. Help us have safe driving, patient driving. Help us uh, be loving. Let us show you in our life so that people would say, wow, there's something about us. Not just because of the church we go to or the, the people we hang out, Lord, but just let the effects of you just come out of us. So it's the evidence is against us. So we thank you, Lord. We ask your blessing today. Jesus, in your prayer, which I